Oh gosh, I'm so glad you guys are here today. What a week we've had, right? You know, the Lord laid this message on my heart several months ago and just kind of kept adding to it. And so let me preface this by saying, if if this feels in any way like, wow, this is talking to me this week, I don't know that. Only the Holy Spirit knew the timing of this message. But we're going to open with a little game. Okay, so I'm going to give you two choices. Now, if you prefer the first choice, then you stand up. If you prefer the second choice, then you stay seated, okay? Some of you are going to stay seated the whole time, and then I'm going to know that you're just not playing the game, okay? But if the first thing I say is the thing you prefer of the two choices, you stand up. If the second thing is, you stay seated, okay? So coffee to tea. Who prefers coffee? You would stand. You can kind of look around, see. Oh, Ty, I know you prefer coffee, sir. I know that. All right, so we've got some tea drinkers. Good to know. You can have a seat. How about Target to Walmart? Really? I thought that was just everybody would stand. Um, All right, how about book to movie? You would rather read, you stand, you'd rather movie, stay seated. Oh, I was going to tell you, if my husband stood up, that would be a lie in church. (laughs) He... He likes to order books, but not always read all the pages. Go ahead and have a seat. If you prefer cat to dog, stand up. Oh, there's some cat folks. Okay, that's great. All right, if you prefer summer to fall. If you prefer fall, stay seated. If you prefer summer, stand up. Okay, makes sense. Makes sense. All right, have a seat. See who's just like you. If you prefer ocean to mountain, stand up if you're an ocean person. Yeah, probably a lot of the same summer people, right? <laughs> Makes sense. Okay, have a seat. If you prefer city to small town, if you're a city person, I would definitely be standing right now. That's me. This does not surprise me at a church in Rhinebeck, by the way. <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> Let's see, who of you that are standing, let's, let's keep you up if you're a city person. I would say sit back down if you grew up in a small town. Okay, that makes a lot of sense too. All right, one more, one more. If you prefer history to current events, stand if you prefer history. Really? Guys, are you watching the news? You prefer current events. Okay, go ahead and have a seat. You know, that was just to illustrate, well, really, I just feel like I don't know you well enough. (laughs) No, 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 I'm just messing with you. It's just that each of us has this God-given personality, right? That he created us with these preferences. And when it comes to things like coffee or tea, it's not right or wrong, right? Ty can prefer coffee. I can prefer tea. We're not going to have a big disagreement about it. If I made the coffee, you would all prefer tea. Um, But, you know, when it comes down to to minor preferences, those aren't a big deal. If you spent any time around my husband and I, you know that we are different in just about every way. Um, But one thing that we've really learned in 23 years of marriage is any time that we approach anything, his question is going to be, how do you do it right? And my question is going to be, how do you do it fast? And typically those are not the same answer. (laughs) I don't care if he does it his way, because at least it will be right. He's going to notice if I do it my way, (laughs) because it'll be like cutting corners or something like that. Um, But the truth is, it's hard to to feel like you're on the same page as every person all the time. And really, it's impossible, right? Because this uniquely designed person that God has put in your sphere of influence, whether it's your spouse, your children, your coworkers, your boss, people you communicate with at church, the things that God plants in us that make us different and unique from one another are often the very things that we find it challenging to navigate in relationships, that this person isn't doing it my way. The world would go a lot better for all of us if every single person did what we wanted the way we wanted them to do it, right? Anybody a parent in here? Wouldn't it be great if your kids just did what you asked the way you asked them to do it? It would be a miracle. (laughs) But 
It would make our lives easier. But now we live in this climate where the issues at stake are much bigger than coffee or tea or mountain or ocean. We have major, major issues at stake. And in a season where cooperation and unity is so hard to find, I thought we could take a look today at some biblical examples of people coming together and how they managed to stay united even on issues that were really, really tough for them. You know, we like to think that we're the first ones in history to ever come up on some historical or political context that's difficult to navigate, but that's not the case. We can see even biblical examples of personalities and the struggle that they maybe had to connect, but the church has to lead the way in unity. Now, I don't just mean unity in these four walls. That's, well, yeah, four walls. It's kind of a weird shape, but it's still four right? Okay, focus. So (laughs) unity, four walls. What's in the church matters. We have to be able, listen, if we can't love well in the church, then you're definitely not loving well outside of the church. I'm just going to say that real real simply because sometimes you think, no, it's easy for me to love the world. No, it's not. That's phony. If you can't love your brothers and sisters in Christ, whatever you're giving the world is some fake counterfeit that they're better off without, honestly. If you can't truly love one another in here. So that's a given, right? We need to be in unity. We know we need to be in unity with our spouses. We need to have unity in our families. We need to have unity if we're you know, on a team at work or whatever. We need to have this spirit of cooperation. But how do we find common ground with people that might believe differently than us, or even the lost? How do we demonstrate unity? How do we demonstrate love to people that are very, very different? Let's look at Acts 1. Acts 1, 12 through 14. We're going to hit on a few different biblical examples today. So this is right after Jesus ascends into heaven. Right after Jesus ascends into heaven, and we see Acts 1, verses 12 through 14, And it says, Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So here we have all of these personalities praying for something, coming together, almost like the very first modern church, right? They all get together. And just the background of a few people in the upper room that day, you have Matthew, who was a tax collector, who we know that these were people that were really dishonest in their money collections, the people that were pretty despised by the rest of the community. You have Simon the Zealot who was a political activist in his younger years. A political activist. You know what this tells me? It's really okay to care about politics. It's really okay to care about issues that affect humanity. It's just not okay to care about them more than you care about the humanity they affect. Right? You've got to have them in their proper place. And so Simon was a political activist. And then you have James and John who were so passionate that they were nicknamed the Sons of Thunder. Sons of Thunder. These are not, that's probably what, Ron calls me when he's adjusting my microphone, (laughs) the sons of thunder, Um, daughter of thunder because my voice. So these aren't wallflower types, right? These aren't people with no opinions. These aren't, you know, bless, bless your heart. I don't really care. It's whatever you want. These are big personalities. And this is just four of the many people in that room. So they had to come together with this directive, advance the gospel into every corner of the world. There's no church manual. There's no way to follow the people that have done it before you. You need to be spirit led. And by the way, it may cost you your very, very life. How could so many different personalities come together for a common cause? Because it's easy to cooperate when you know what's at stake. It's easy to cooperate when you know what's at stake. Imagine this. You, you um, come up on an accident scene. I don't know if you've ever seen, I'm sure you have, driving down the road, kind of a, a bad accident scene. And you pull up and you see this person who's injured on the road. And you call 911 and the ambulance drivers arrive, right? Driver one and driver two. And there they are. And they jump out. This person's on the road. They're bleeding. It's life or death. They need immediate medical attention. And both the drivers run out. They have their medical bags. They're running towards this person bleeding. And they begin to, to you know, um, administer first aid. But the driver one says to driver two, whoa, whoa, whoa. 
Why are you using that kind of gods? That's not the right kind. In my training, look, I've been doing this for 20 years. I've been at this scene for 20 years. You're new. You don't know. I've done this before. This is what you're supposed to do. Driver two, no, no, no. I was trained in a bigger, better situation. This is what you do. And as they sit there and fight about the detail, this petty detail, this person is gone. They're lost. Friends, that would be ridiculous. You know what we would call that? We would call that negligent, right? We would say they had an opportunity to save someone's life, but they didn't because they were so focused on something that shouldn't matter. Can I tell you, friends, that when you elevate your opinions higher than the word of God, and nobody ever thinks they're doing that, right? We're like, yeah, of course, that would be a sin. My opinions are godly. They're not my opinions. So my opinions are the same as the word of God, right? No, (laughs) no. When you start to have petty disagreements about things that are not sinful or scriptural, they're just your preference, and you begin to say, you did it this way, and that's wrong, and you, while the world is lost and dying, and we're so focused on our minor disagreements, on our minor misunderstandings, our friends, even your major ones, we forget what's at stake. Let's look at Genesis 45, 1 through 8. Let me tell you a little bit about Joseph in case you don't know. Joseph is born into a big family. He's favored by his dad. His dad likes him more than all his other brothers and sisters, um, brothers especially. um, I know what that's like because I feel like I'm my parents' favorite, but (laughs) they don't always listen to my sermons, so they'll just, I'm going to just imagine that they're saying amen if they're watching. But no, jealous. Um, They sell him to slave traders. They fake his death. He ends up in a high-ranking official's house. Now, imagine if you're Joseph, you're sold into slavery. These slave traders take you, and they um, make you a slave, and then you end up in this high-ranking official's house. I would feel like breath of fresh air, right? Like the enemy didn't prosper. I ended up in Potiphar's house. Only Potiphar's wife is a real creep. And she gets the hots for Joseph, accuses him of something he didn't do. He ends up in prison. Now he's in prison, in jail, and he has this God-given gift of interpreting dreams. And the prison officials are bringing him dreams. He's accurately interpreting them. And then Pharaoh has some troubling dreams. Joseph accurately interprets these dreams. Ends up saving the entire nation from famine because he told Pharaoh how to strategize and protect people and what to do, and he ends up being one of the highest ranking officials in Pharaoh's court. So that's where we find him here. And then the very brothers that tried to sell him into slavery show up. Genesis 45, 1 through 8. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants, and he cried out, have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers, and he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed. Do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been famine in the land. And for the next five years, there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, Lord of his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. You know what this story illustrates to me? People do not have to treat us well. Or give us what we think we deserve for us to live in unity with them. People do not have to treat us well for us to treat them well. The saving of many lives is what is most important. The saving, if anybody ever in scripture had a right in, in, all of history to say, I'm not helping you. (laughs) I'm not going to do this for you. You can starve. You can die. Remember when you threw me in a pit? God's vengeance, right? He's going to get you. Now you can just go home and suffer and remember what you did to me. If anyone ever had a right, that would be Joseph. But instead, he said, it wasn't you. It was God. God was sovereign in this situation. It was for the saving of many lives. So don't be angry with yourself. 
I love that, that line in Scripture because what it says is Joseph not only looked past his own offense, to, but to the brokenness and fear of the men standing before him. You're mad at yourself. You're scared. Don't be. He ministered to their heart even when he had every reason to be angry. What happens a lot of times when we're believers is we start to think that because we know God, that everything that we say and do equals what God would say and do. And we start to think that our way is the same as God's way. And what happens when we do that, when we don't recognize our rightful place, that God is God and we are not, we begin to kind of build this altar to our own opinions, to our own ideas, right? And then what happens when we've built an altar to ourselves is we are going to sacrifice someone else on it every single time. Because they're going to offend us, they're going to say something they shouldn't, they're going to do something they shouldn't. Hear me, in your marriage, when you've built an altar to what I deserve, As a wife, I deserve this. As a husband, I deserve this. And you build an altar to that. Every single time your spouse does not do what you think they should, which after 23 years, I can tell you, like, that never happens. No, it's going to happen, right? Okay. And then you're going to sacrifice them on that altar. How dare you? Because I know what I deserve. Well, friends, the same is true in, in all relationships in our life, when we begin to I- idolize our own opinions, our own feelings, we build this altar to ourselves, and we begin to sacrifice others on it instead of building an altar to God. And when we build an altar to God, you are sovereign, you are worthy, you reign supreme. We build an altar to him. Do you know who sacrifice on that altar? Us, you, me. Because when we see the lost and dying, the hurting, the broken, And friends, I can tell you that if you're not seeing them, you've built an altar to yourself because they are all around you. Not just at the mission field 2,000 miles away, but they're around you in Rhinebeck. They're around you in Waterloo. There are women today in the valley of decision facing an unexpected pregnancy that tonight will take a pill that will end the baby's life. They are all around you. There are men uh, uh, so anxious and so depressed that tonight they will end up in a hospital on a suicide hold because they don't feel like they have a reason to live another day. They are all around you. There are people facing diagnoses that are far bigger than anything their brain can even comprehend, and they feel hopeless, and they feel lost, and they feel like this is how the rest of my life is going to be, all around us, all the time. And when we build an altar to God, we'll say, that is so important. I know what's at stake, that my emotions are not what, what information hits first. Let me say this. When you've elevated your own opinions, everything processes through. How does this make me feel? How does this affect me? Right? When our spirit is what's elevated, when we say, I've built an altar to God, then it doesn't process through our emotions and eventually our spirit catches up. It processes through our spirit first and our emotions catch up. So when somebody says at work, oh, come here, come here. You know, I heard them talking and they're going to lay people off. Yeah, when my emotions hear that, you know what I think? How could they? I've worked here 20 years. What am I going to do? How am I going to feed my family? What's going to happen to our savings? I'm not going to find another job like this. We're going to have to move. What if we lose our house? That's what. But my spirit says, no weapon formed against me will prosper. If the enemy wants to take my finances, he can have them because I serve Jehovah Jireh. God is my provider. He's a cattle on a thousand hills. I'm not worried about it. I'm not worried about tomorrow. I'm not worried about the next day. I'm not worried. If they want it, they can have it because they can't take anything from me that God wants me to have. I'm not worried. And then my emotions are right in line with my spirit. But when we begin to build an altar to our emotions, everything passes through there. And friends, it's how people that know the Lord well still can get so anxious, so heavy, so worried, so burdened down because their spirit is lining up with their feelings instead of the other way. Let's look at Romans 8, 16 through 17. It says, Romans 8, 16 through 17, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. A while ago, we were uh, relocating many years ago to Indiana 
for a ministry position. And a friend of a friend told us about this guy that owned a house that he was renting, and it was just the space that we needed in the right neighborhood and the right school district, and we were so excited, and we um, signed the rental contract, and all was good, and we were loading the moving truck, literally leaving the very next morning. So we're in Bettendorf, the truck is loaded, we're ready to go, we're leaving the next morning, and I get a phone call from the gentleman. And he says, hi, I'm so-and-so, I'm the homeowner, and um, I needed to talk with you about the arrangement that we have, okay? And he proceeds to say, you know, you were referred to me, a friend of a friend, (laughs) your last name is Ifidiaga, I didn't realize who you were, but... I ran into someone at church who told me your maiden name, and I found out that I know your parents. And your parents, I have a lot of respect for them, particularly your dad. Your dad has helped me with some things. Your dad has done a lot for me. And so because of my respect for him, I need to tell you the truth, which is my house is in foreclosure, and I no longer own it. The bank owns the home, and I don't have any legal right to rent it to you, Um, but I needed the income. The problem is if the bank finds out you're there, they only have to give you 72 hours to vacate. So I just couldn't sleep knowing that I knew who you were. Friends, can I tell you that he couldn't do what he wanted to do because he knew my dad? Let me let this settle into you. The enemy cannot do to you what he has planned because he knows who your father is. You are co-heirs with every single person you encounter. Every single man, woman, and child you encounter is one that God purposefully designed, that God fearfully and wonderfully made. They either know it and recognize their place in the kingdom or they don't yet know and they're the ones that we're meant to reach. But we're co-heirs and because we have a respect for the Father, we have a respect for one another. He couldn't rent me that house because he knew he was going to see my dad at church. He knew what my dad had done for him, and he didn't feel right taking advantage of his child. Can I tell you, friends, that when someone rubs you the wrong way, bumps into you, and and that fruit of the Spirit is really being picked, man, this one is hard for me to connect with. This one I don't have patience for. Can I say that maybe that's God's design to teach you that it wasn't about you anyway, that you're co-heirs with a bigger kingdom, that it wasn't about your feelings, it wasn't wasn't about your emotions. When it's difficult to connect, hear me, co-heirs don't just have a kingdom inheritance, they have a kingdom identity. And they say, because you're my brother in Christ, because you're my sister in Christ, I'm going to look past this disagreement because I have an honor for the Father who created you. You know, when I stand in front of churches and I speak about the pro-life movement, which is just my passion, I'll tell you that I rarely encounter someone in a church who isn't pro-life. Oh, yeah, babies deserve to be born. Hallelujah, I'm with you. Only here's the thing. If that baby is fearfully and wonderfully made, so is that grown woman who's thinking about having abortion. If that baby is fearfully and wonderfully made, oh, tuck your toes in, so is Joe Biden. If that baby is fearfully and wonderfully made, so is Kamala Harris. That God had a plan for their life. And if we would spend a little more time in our knees, not just interceding for that baby, but for the grown men and women who don't yet know him, friends, then the world might be easier to say, yeah, they really are pro-life. Because the, the tough thing for people to see is that sometimes we argue issues while the very people that carry those issues stand in front of us and we battle with them. Or they'll say, I went to church when I was a little girl. And they did this. My parents went to church, and somebody they went to church with got mad at them about something petty, and then they stopped going, and I stopped going. And I wonder, where is that that cooperation? Where is that unity? Where is that we are co-heirs? You know, several months ago, I I was talking to a gal. She doesn't go here, okay? Don't look at my caller ID. She doesn't go here. But... She was having an issue with someone in her church, and they're both church leaders, and they both felt that the other one had treated 
the other one wrongly. You know, he did this, he said this, he shouldn't have done that. She did this, she did that, she shouldn't have done that. Both holding themselves to a really high standard. And because I knew them both well, they were looking for some kind of counsel. And both of them quickly said this to me. I know I don't need to worry about it because vengeance is the Lord's. Okay. (laughs) I think what you're saying is, I don't need to worry about it because God will get them. But friends, can I tell you that when we act like God is some holy referee taking sides in our petty disagreements, we've forgotten what's at stake. When we think that vengeance is the Lord's means that I can keep a list, a journal page I'm going to rip out and take with me to heaven and say, hallelujah, I'm so glad I'm here. This mercy that poured from the cross that I never deserved. I'm so glad you restored me and redeemed me and forgave all my sins. Here's my neighbor whose dog would not quit barking. Vengeance is yours. Let's get him. Right? Vengeance is yours, God. Here's that lady in church who always sings the wrong words super loud. It's me, I know. Put your word, you know. You write these names down and you think God will get them. And we're so blinded to our own sin that we don't realize that our name would probably be on people's list too. Right? And aren't you glad that we serve a God whose vengeance is for the enemy, the stealer, the killer, the destroyer of our souls? That his desire is to see humans restored. His desire is that he would will that none would perish. So when we start to say, this one wronged me, vengeance is God's, I can tell you that you have the heart of a Pharisee and not the heart of a disciple. Because Pharisees love to see justice dispensed to those who have sinned. And disciples love to see people restored to the heart of God. Is there a place for justice? Yes, but hear me. It's reserved for the enemy. And God is not looking in heaven saying, who can I smite today? Who who crossed Pastor Dan at work? Who can I smite? Who looked at Blake funny? That's not the God that we serve. Friends, and when we reduce him to a referee, you know what happens? We've already decided we're right. I'm right, they're wrong. Sometimes we can even be so good at twisting scripture, we can convince ourselves there's no sin in me. There's none. There's none righteous except me. I handle that perfectly. I'm, I'm blameless. Get them, God. But every single time that I have prayed that prayer, vengeance is the Lord's, I'm almost immediately met with, you know, get them, God, with all the things that I could do to show compassion with all the ways that my own pride or my own agenda had gotten in the way, with all the ways that I could pray the heart of the Father over that person. And man, does it shift my perspective. It's so hard to be in unity with somebody that you think God's going to strike with lightning because they crossed you. Unity looks like I prefer God, honestly, over seeing you hurt over seeing you pay the price for your sin when I was so quickly forgiven of mine. Co-heirs don't just have a kingdom inheritance in common. They have a kingdom identity. They understand that we, we don't just inherit heaven. We inherit the heart of God, which is love and compassion and kindness. Now, there's an artificial unity, a counterfeit unity that the world loves to sell. And it's this, I'll I'll just ignore it, and that's how we'll get unity. I'll just ignore sin, that's how we'll get unity. I'll just ignore the disagreement, it's how we'll get unity. I'll trade short-term comfort for long-term dysfunction, and I'll just, I'll just ignore it. Friends, that's not what we're asking you to do today. But there's more than two options. The first isn't, let me beat you down till you see it my way and you wave a white flag of surrender because I finally bullied you into realizing that you're scum and I'm not. That's option A. Option B is, I'm just going to say, oh, bless it, everything's fine. And I'll just ignore it and ignore it and ignore it, and then I, until I can't, and then I'll scream at somebody totally unrelated to the issue so that the people I'm really mad at never really know. Friends, that's, that's not healthy. That's not Christ-like. That's not biblical. There's another option. We don't just have to 
ignore evil. We have authority to destroy it. We have authority to destroy it in ourselves. And we have authority to take, I mean, I love the words of that song today. All sorrow, all bondage. There is nothing that the enemy has brought into this world that the Lord does not have sovereignty over, right? You believe that? And so we have authority to say, you know what? Pride does not get to have the last say in this relationship. We have authority to say fear, anxiety, worry. You don't get to tell me how I feel. We can, we can destroy those things that affect unity. Because can I tell you, the things that come in, it's like this. It's fear. Well, if I don't handle this now, the last time I didn't deal with this, then this happened and this happened and this happened. And because I never healed and because I never got whole and I carry bitterness and brokenness into my, my current relationships, when you do something, it reminds me of what he or she did 10 years ago. And that fear and that brokenness is what causes me to lash out. That's why I don't have unity. It's not because you're sinning. It's because I never got right. I can destroy that evil, that unforgiveness, that brokenness, that shame. I can destroy it so that when I talk to you, I'm healing and whole. You're not pouring salt into a raw and open wound that God didn't mean for me to carry around. Right? Got one away. Good thing you're doing the driving, so I'm glad you're the one. I was nervous. Okay. (laughs) Because, friends, here's the thing. It's really, really hard to stand in unity with people who have hurt us. Good thing Jesus did that for us, right? That while we were still sinners, he died for us. Before they're sorry, before they know what they've done, before they acknowledge it, or even if they never do, we can still forgive and walk in wholeness. You know, sometimes I think, We have this desire to confront things that bother us. And we like to label them as sin. Like, you know, all right, somebody needs to talk to Megan. She's not from Iowa. She doesn't know. We we don't just park our cars here like little weirdos. We back them in. Okay, that's what we do. We need to back them in. We're not going to have anyone sneak up on us while we're trying to reverse. We want to see the whole lot. We're going to pull in, and I don't care how long it takes me. I'm going to reverse into my spot. You don't know what I'm talking about unless you're not from here. But when you go out and all the cars are facing, it's like, what? Why are they? Is everyone trying to run out? Are people trying to make a quick getaway? We don't do that where I'm from. But it's just an example. We just we pick little things in people that sounds a little like getting the the speck out of our brother's eye while we ignore the plank in our own. And it's the unrepentant sin in our own heart that is the number one destroyer of unity. Let me say it one more time. It's the unrepentant sin in our own heart that is the destroyer of unity. Now, this world needs an unafraid, unapologetically bold church more than ever. But what it doesn't need is a church who knows how to type eloquent and hate-filled responses on Facebook and then walk in the doors on Sunday and sing to a God whose love they haven't shared with a single lost soul in years. The world doesn't need that. How's that helping? Is it okay to stand for righteousness? Absolutely. But if you're not doing it in a context of a three-dimensional relationship, right, because the Internet's two-dimensional, you're missing it. If you say, I care deeply about this issue, I care so deeply about it that I'm up all night watching the news. I care so deeply about it that I wake up at four in the morning in a cold sweat because I'm scared for our country. Friends, that's all good and well, but listen to me. There better come a day where you put some shoes on and you go out and you find a homeless person and buy them lunch, or you find a woman in the valley of decision and put your arm around her. Because if all you do is type answers, hear me, you're working for the enemy. You're arm in arm with someone's agenda. But if you're not advancing the gospel, if you're not forcefully advancing the kingdom of God, then whose kingdom are you advancing? That's hard to hear, I know. I know. 
Because everything in us says, I want to fight this righteous fight. And I think that's wonderful. Put on the full armor of God and go out and do it. But don't you ever forget that every word that you type is read by a person who may not know the God that died for them, who may not know that Jesus bled so that they could be whole, who may not know that they too have a kingdom inheritance and are a co-heir. And if you waste all your words telling them how stupid they are, you might not have any left to tell them how loved they are. So that's right. So let's look at Luke 23. Let's look at Luke 23. We are arm in arm with an agenda. Luke 23, verse 8. I read through Luke the month of December. And when I got to this part of scripture, just something in me thought, oh, oh, that, that is a sentence. We cannot forget. Luke 23, verse 8. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased because for a long time he had been wanting to see him. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform a sign of some sort. When, let's stop there. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased. Oh, good. I'm glad you're here. You're going to do exactly what I want. You know what that sounds like a little? Vengeance is the, the Lord's. I'm glad he's here. He is going to show you who's really right. I want to see you do a miracle. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priest and the teachers of the law were standing there vehemently accusing him. Then Herod and his soldiers, let me stop there. Three verses, y'all. That's all it took for his heart to shift. Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him when they realized Jesus did it. I'm, this is not the scripture. Look up. Don't keep reading if you're looking in your Bible for what I'm about to say. They ridiculed and mocked him. Scripture stops. This is my interjection. When they realized he didn't work for them. When they realized he had a mind of his own. When they realized that as the king of kings and lord of lords, he wasn't going to be a circus monkey who performed on, on demand. Back to scripture, vehemently accusing him. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him, dressing him in an elegant robe. They sent him back to Pilate. Now verse 12 is what leapt off the page. That day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this, they had been enemies. They became friends. They became friends, united in their common offense, united in their, their agenda, United in their hurt and their frustration. Friends, you're linking arms with some agenda today. You are. And I know that this is a hard word for people who might be caught up. Listen, like I said, I did not plan this time at all. I promise you. We had no idea. Our daughter was supposed to have a baby by now, and we're supposed to be in Ohio. And that little thing is just cooking along and taking her sweet time. Turns out she's one of us. <laughs> but, but listen... I know that there's this righteous anger that wells up that says, no more. Just be careful what you are binding and loosing. Be careful who you're becoming friends with. Be careful what agenda you align with. Be careful what your motive is. Because if it is anything less than to see the lost restored to God, if your motive is to see people destroyed, if your motive is to see vengeance rain down on everybody who disagrees, that's not the heart of God. So check your heart. Check your motive. And defend the unity because of what's at stake. You know, never before has it been quite so hard for believers to get on the same page when it comes to even just current events. All over the spectrum, you see people who say, I fall here, I fall there, I believe this, I believe that. And what happens is we become so tied to that that we look around and say, okay, we're the same, we're not the same. We're the same, we're not the same. We're the same, we're not the same. And we link arms with those who think just like us. Instead of saying, I wonder what your experience is. I wonder what your story is. I wonder what your background is. I wonder why you feel that way. You know, I'll never forget an encounter I had many years ago with a woman who found out that I was pro-life. And she just, as a woman, how could you be? How could you? So I shared my story of, of being adopted and the horrific situation that my mother walked through of, of facing a, a, um, 
terminal, what they told me was a terminal pregnancy. And, and I shared my whole story with her. And there was never a hint of softness. There was just hardness and anger. And then I, I said, okay, do you have a story you want to share with me? No. <laughs> nope. Nope. I know I'm right. I know you're wrong. I don't want to share your story. And she walked away. And one of my mentors said, whenever somebody fights that hard for something, it's because they've done it. Man. 20 some years later, I can tell you that's probably true about her life. And what she heard, what we wanted her to hear was our heart of love. But what she was hearing was, you would judge me and condemn me. Friends, when we listen to people's stories, we may be able to find a common ground. That's this. God loves you. God has a plan for your life. God desires for you to walk in freedom. All bondage, all shame, it doesn't just leave my life, it leaves yours. That fear that keeps you up at night, let me pray with you. That peace that you're finding hard to find, I have some scriptures I can share with you. When we begin to share the heart of God with the lost, the worship team can come on up. Or even with each other. Unity is so much easier. Because it was God's design, right, that we don't fight each other. It was God's design that we would cooperate. So here's some elements of unity. Let me just throw this out. As the worship team comes, um, these are some questions we can ask ourselves. First, Lord, what do I need to repent of? Not do I need to repent. Yeah, y'all, me too. Not do I need to repent. You better do that every day, right? But how specifically do I need to repent in areas where maybe I haven't contributed to unity? How do I need to repent? Have I been too self-serving in my marriage? Have I been too critical of my children? Have I spoken more about what they're not instead of what God designed them to be? God, where do I need to repent? Secondly, do I have a genuine love for others? Now, this is one of those questions. It's like if you ask somebody, are you crazy? They always say no, right? If I say, do you love people? Christians are always like, yeah, of course. Of course I do. All right. But the fruit of that is what in your life? A genuine love for others doesn't look like, um, you know, I, I'm nice to people. It looks like when they offend me, I'm not looking to make that right. I'm not looking to make them pay. I'm not looking to make them suffer. I'm looking to forgive, to restore, to speak the heart of God over the situation. Do I have a genuine love for others? Do I want to see them prosper in the goodness of God instead of suffer in their sin? And then the lastly, do I have faith in the sovereignty of God? When I said the world needs a bold and unapologetic church, I meant this. The world needs a church that rises up and says, I know who my God is. I know my hope was never in a man or a woman to save the day. My hope was never in a lawmaker or a courtroom to change the hearts of men and women. My hope was never in somebody treating me the way that I wanted or giving me what I deserve. My hope was always in the one who sits enthroned above the circle of the earth. The one who all of heaven cries out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And do I think that now, after all these generations of God's eyes on his children, he's going to look away and give up his throne and lay down his authority? not for one second so the sovereignty of God rises up and I say he'll win he'll have the last word he'll have his day and I know this that when the church can rise up and say we're not shaken we're not afraid we're not worried we're not anxious we're not declaring death and destruction but we know who our God is we know where our help comes from and I think church now more than ever If we can look across the aisles in our sanctuaries, look across the table in our homes, look across in the world and say, we're not the same, but God is sovereign. God is sovereign. And my faith is in him. So I'm going to build an altar to his sovereignty. I'm going to build an altar to the fact that nothing happens without his permission. That he is bigger than my agenda. That he can use all things. And that no man, no woman, no situation, no diagnosis, no past, no present, no future will ever take from his sovereignty, either in my life or in this world. Because the beautiful thing about a sovereign king 
as he is as sovereign as he is, whether we acknowledge it or not. So my hope isn't in people's hearts changing or doing what they should. My hope is in a sovereign God who will never fail us. So if you would just stand to your feet today, I want us to just take a moment. And I'm not going to have us come forward, but just right in our seat. I want you to begin to search your heart. God, do I need to repent? Lord, am I showing genuine love? Do I know just how sovereign you are? Am I declaring your sovereignty over situations and places and people and things? And as we worship the Lord, I'm going to ask you to pray the bold prayer. God, is there something in me that needs to change? person next to you, even across the aisles. If you're not comfortable because of, of the pandemic, totally understand. It's okay if you don't. But if you're able, grab somebody's hand this morning. And we're going to pray a prayer of unity. We're going to pray a prayer of repentance. If my people will humble themselves. Friends, we're going to pray that prayer. And I'm going to ask you to join your faith with the man and the woman on your left and your right. 
And we as a church, as we stand in unity, we're going to begin to declare the power of God. I love these words. All bondage. So as you pray over that person on your left and your right, begin to ask the Holy Spirit, what bondage are we breaking? Anxiety, depression, fear, sickness, all bondage. And friends, let's begin to pray in power for that person on our sides. And let's begin to declare God's best. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we welcome you into this place. God, we declare that we will be a people of unity, that we will seek your face before we seek our own agenda. Lord, we repent as a people. We repent as a church. We repent as a believers for the times that we have elevated our own agenda over your own, where we have missed your hand at work. God, we repent and we humble ourselves and we ask for your mercy on our land. We ask for your mercy on our country. We ask for justice to flow like rivers in the street, to restore the broken, to set free the captive, to see those that are walking in darkness come to know a great light, the savior and redeemer of their souls. Lord, we declare over every man and woman in this house today, supernatural freedom, freedom from all sorrow, from all bondage, a declaration that they will know their kingdom identity and inheritance. We join hands with our brothers and sisters in Christ, declaring that we are co-heirs in the kingdom. We are co-heirs with you. And the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in us. So we take that authority out of the walls of this church and we begin to walk in the stores. We begin to walk in the marketplace. We begin to walk in our workplaces and our homes with that same authority that all bondage will come to bow with the name of Jesus. Every sickness healed, every brokenness restored, every hurt made whole. That God, you didn't come to do a partial work. So let I pray that you would use your sons and daughters today to declare that love that you have for the lost, the love that you have for each other that God we know you are faithful and you are just and you can be trusted so today we collectively lift our hearts and say you are sovereign you are king of kings you are lord of lords you are alpha and omega the great I am and all of creation bows at your feet today us included to say thank you lord thank you lord for the work that only you can do thank you for moving Thank you for loving us. And today, Lord, we call your people blessed, full of power, full of hope, full of joy, full of purpose. And Lord, we ask for your heart and your eyes as we walk this world around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen, church. We're so glad you were here today. Have a blessed week.